Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Anna. I'm a clinical psychology doctorate student and I make videos about real life applications to psychology. And in this video, we're talking about the psychology behind the Black Swan movie. So if this is the type of stuff you're interested in, please hit like and subscribe so that you can see more. So I recently rewatched Black Swan and I was just blown away by how much psychological content it had. There is a lot for me to get through, so I will try to break it up on topic. We have to talk about eating body dysmorphia, psychosis, skin picking, dissociation, depersonalization, OCD, perfectionism, overbearing parents, and more. So I'm just going to give a brief recap of the movie if you don't remember what it was or if you haven't seen it just to get a sense of what it's about. This is not my synopsis, I just found it off the internet. So Nina, played by Natalie Portman, is a ballerina whose passion for the dance rules every facet of her life. When the company's artistic director decides to replace his prima ballerina Beth for their opening production of Swan Lake, Nina is his first choice. She has competition in newcomer Lily, played by Mila Kunis. While Nina is perfect for the role of the white swan, Lily personifies the black swan. As rivalry between the two dancers transforms into a twisted friendship, Nina's dark side begins to emerge. So one thing that they don't really talk about is that in this production of Black Swan, the ballerina that plays the white swan has to be the same ballerina that plays the black swan, which is very important and I'll go into explaining a little bit more about this, but what you should know about the overall synopsis of this ballet is that the black swan seduces the white swan's lover and then the white swan jumps to her death. So I think that this movie is incredibly important for just showing the dark side of the dance industry. You know, we are talking about EDs, backstabbing, gossiping, body and age shaming, jealousy, paranoia, and abuses of power. And you know, you're pretty much guaranteed to have body image issues when your entire career is something that is focused on your body and the movements that it makes. And I've heard from other professionals, I think even when I was growing up, because I did some dancing when I was little, that if you are in the dance industry or if you are a dancer, there tends to be this hyper focus on your body that can turn into something like body dysmorphia or like an ED. So first let's start with the obsessive compulsive nature of Nina's many anxieties and many disorders because I do think that she has an OCD component to many of her issues. So she has skin picking, which is a disorder within the OCD category of the DSM. So it is a compulsion to pick your skin. And also body dysmorphia, which we'll talk about at great length, is also a component of the OCD chapter. And in addition to that, the nature of her ED is very obsessive and compulsive, and she has these obsessions with being perfect, and she takes these compulsive precautions to ensure that she's perfect. For instance, dancing until the point of exhaustion. That would be a compulsion because she's obsessed with the idea of being perfect. Now, it's unclear to me which ED she has. I'm so sorry that I can't just state the word. I would really love to, but unfortunately YouTube likes to censor this specific topic, which is ridiculous because it doesn't censor any other category of the DSM-5, but let me just get off my soapbox for a minute. So it's unclear to me whether she has the one that starts with A or the one that starts with B because there's clearly a restrictive component. She clearly has anxiety about eating, which makes me think the first one, but also she purges. But what you might not know is that purging is actually a subcategory of the first ED as well. It is the binge subtype, but it could be concurrent with, you know, restricting. Now, Nina clearly has some body dysmorphia, and you notice whenever she's looking at her reflection in a mirror or something of the sort, it's always a distorted view of herself. So she never looks like her, and sometimes she looks like other people, and it gets to the point of psychosis. So possibly this is triggered because she does take Molly at one point and um, this is known that Molly can trigger a psychotic episode especially in people who are already prone to psychosis and this is actually the first moment that she starts to have these visual hallucinations so it could very well be that it's triggered by that and remember that psychosis is not just schizophrenia it's a break from reality and it can really emerge in any mental disorder so her psychosis has some schizophrenic elements in that there's paranoia and visual hallucinations, but aside from that, I don't think she meets the full criteria of schizophrenia. I view it more as a dissociation and body 
dysmorphia to the extreme where reality testing is compromised and bodily hallucinations are the ultimate form of body dysmorphia psychosis. I mean, that is, you know, having a hallucination to do with your body is the ultimate, most severe form of body But like I said, she also has some paranoia, like thinking that Lily is after her, when in reality, at the end, we see that she is not. There's also a very depersonalized, dissociative component to her hallucinations. So her reflection is no longer moving like she is. So she's definitely completely broken her sense of self. And it's beyond not having a realistic view of your body, it really goes beyond that at this point. At this point, it's about being so detached from reality that you are having actual hallucinations to do with this type of mental illness. And I wouldn't say that it's depersonalization or derealization disorder, which is a dissociative disorder, because it's part of a psychotic episode and not rather a recurrent chronic pattern of her dissociating. It is very much due to the stress of being perfect in the show rather than, you know, chronically feeling depersonalized. I think that it's very much brought on by the psychotic episode that she has. So what are her diagnoses? I would diagnose her with brief psychotic disorder and skin picking disorder and also components of OCD and components of body Now it's very possible that she also has body I would really have to know a little bit more about the situation. But either way, some things that are very clear is there's a very obsessive compulsive component to her mental illness. And you know, there's this idea of her compartmentalizing different aspects of her identity to the point where she experiences a dissociative identity schism. So it's not that she has multiple personalities, although it may seem like she does, it's like she has this schism in her two personas. So part of her wants to be the sweet, perfect, good girl. And part of her wants to be the black swan. She wants to be bad and impulsive and do whatever she wants. And the issue is that she cannot integrate the two. So it's not that she has multiple personalities. It's not that she has dual personalities. It's that she cannot put the two together. She cannot integrate them into two. She has to be either one or the other. And if you think about it, Nina's character is very childlike. If we look at her room, her appearance, her relationship with her mom, it's very much like a repressed and shy child. And when a repressed and shy child suddenly discovers rebellion, say in adolescence, it's far more likely to be destructive than a child who is already permitted to make some mistakes and already exploring breaking rules in moderation, it's far more likely for that repressed child to swing too far to the other side. So let's talk about this duality for a second, the duality of the black versus white swan and this identity schism. So it reminds me a whole lot of the Madonna horror complex, which I've talked about on this channel before. It's when women are either pure and perfect and virginal, or they are absolute and they are just dirty and dangerous and harmful. And I really actually like the idea of integrating the two in the ballet by having the same ballerina play both. The issue with Nina, of course, is because she is so strongly identifying with the white swan in the beginning, by the end, she cannot integrate it. She cannot integrate it in a healthy way. She can only be one or the other. So, you know, there's this recurring theme of my sweet girl. And Nina gets the part of the white swan perfectly, but she has trouble getting into character for the black swan. She's shy, demure, she follows the rules. She lives an infantilized life under the care of her overbearing mom, which we'll get to in a sec. And in complete stark contrast to this is her perception of Lily. So Lily is carefree, she's open, she's impulsive, she's dangerous, she's risk-taking, and it kind of gives us the impression that Lily is trying to corrupt the repressed Nina. You know, she even has a black wing tattoo on her back. Very clear symbolism that she is, you know, the black swan metaphor. And interestingly, in Nina's hallucination of her love scene with Lily, Lily's face turns into Nina's face at the end. And then this girl who's turned into her face, she kills the sweet girl. She kills the sweet Nina. So this is really the point at which Nina's white swan character goes to die. This is the point at which she kind of kills this pure sweet version of herself. It's also the moment that her psychosis starts. And it just got me thinking, you know, if you let either the white swan or the black swan completely take over, 
that's when you're doomed. You really need a balance of both to be a well-rounded person, to be someone who's not too repressed, you know, too repressed can look like maybe an anxiety disorder, or not too outgoing and too impulsive, which could look like maybe a cluster B personality disorder or a substance use disorder or something else. It's kind of the difference between being compulsive and being impulsive, and the difference between needing to do something and wanting to do something. So impulsive is because you really want to do something and you can't help it. And compulsive is you need to do something or you'll be in great distress. So impulsive could be, for example, you know, drinking too much one day. Compulsive could be, I need to pick up my skin because I'll be in great distress if I don't. Why does Nina turn into an actual swan? It's kind of like method acting. Of course, it's mostly symbolism and it's some psychosis as well but it's essentially her becoming the role that she's trying to play. So she wants to be so perfect and she wants to get the role of the black swan that's so fleeting for her. She wants to get it so perfect that she just loses herself. And by the end, she can't even dance the part of the white swan anymore because that's the issue. She's not integrating these two identities. She's only going to one or the other. And the only way you can truly be perfect is to sacrifice everything, including yourself. So she becomes perfect at the end, but the cost is losing her life, just like the white swan in the play. And I think this is really powerful just to show, you know, the role of a dancer, especially a dancer who has body image and eating issues, how harmful it can be that if you want to be perfect, and you know, even moving beyond you know, dancing. Someone with body image and eating issues wants to be perfect so badly that they're willing to sacrifice themselves for it. So now let's talk a little about her overbearing mom. So her mom, we see, has some mental illness signs as well. So when Nina doesn't want cake, because obviously this is a huge source of anxiety for her, her mom is about to throw it in the trash and to have a fit, which is not exactly a very normal reaction to have. Certainly it's understandable if your daughter has an ED, but you know, I'm not really sure that her mom is aware that her daughter does. Also, when she's cutting Nina's nails, it's almost semi-violent and it's really an invasion of her bodily privacy. And she sleeps in the same room with Nina and Nina can't even be in the bathroom without her mom asking you, are you okay? And she constantly needs to reassure her mom that she is okay. And her mom is controlling to the point where Nina has to actually sneak a stick into her room to make sure that her mom doesn't bust in through the door, which is again, not normal behavior. And her mom won't even let her have a conversation with Lily out in the hall without interfering and telling her to come inside. And she also obsessively paints her daughter. And Nina hallucinates these mom's paintings talking to her during her breakdown. And what they're saying to her at that point is, what happened to my sweet girl? Which she really kind of hears like an echo of what her mom is believing. What happened to my sweet girl? I wanted you to be sweet. I wanted you to be like this and you're not living up to my expectations. And that's why it can be so distressing for her. Whenever there is, you know, a highly controlling parent, the child can often become very perfectionistic, very nothing that they do seems right. And they feel like they have no room to breathe and everything has to be just so, which is by the way, an expression used a lot by people with OCD, or otherwise there will be dire consequences if everything is not perfect and just so. And we also see that Nina's mom is living vicariously through her daughter because she had to give up her dancing career to have her daughter. And Nina can never be the black swan under her mom's care. So we see that she has to completely break free of her mom. There is no in-between because her mom does not allow her to have these adult rules while living under her roof. She has to go and completely break everything and hurt her mom and go have a psychotic break in order to finally feel free. Now, a couple more issues I wanna talk about is how Nina essentially steals Beth's life. So in the beginning, Nina steals Beth's things and it's very much a metaphor. So in a sense, she's also stealing her role in her life. And Beth's character, I think, is pretty good representation of cluster B personality disorders. She's very destructive, dangerous, impulsive, but thrilling to watch. Here, um, Leroy say everything with her is intentional. So even when she is being impulsive, it's because she wants it. Nothing ever happens to her by mistake. And at the end, when Nina is mid-psychosis, she returns to Beth in the hospital and she sees Beth face 
turning into her face and she's saying, I'm nothing. I really saw this scene as being one, a sense of Nina's guilt over essentially stealing Beth's role in her life, but also Nina's sense of worthlessness because this is her face on Beth's body saying, I'm nothing, which definitely sounds like the kind of hallucination that someone with low self-worth might have. And in the end, Leroy finally calls Nina my little princess, just like he used to call Beth which shows that in the end, she did replace Beth, but at what cost? So Leroy's character is also an interesting one because he does sort of abuse his authority. He's an older man, he's in a position of authority to these ballerinas, and yet he has this pattern of, you know, taking advantage of them and forming relationships with them, which it's not clear, do these women actually want this or do they just want the role? Or do they just want to not be in trouble or to not be terrorized at practice? And then to make matters worse, once they reach a certain age, he discards them like he did with Beth. But what I do like about him is he tries to teach Nina about passion, but his expectations are too high and she can't handle the pressure. And he's really not paying attention to the fact that she can't handle the pressure and adding salt to the wound, you know, by getting Lily to try out the dance, which only gives the pressure even harder for Nina. So, you know, the whole Leroy situation just shows how messed up these power struggles can be in dance settings and in other settings, you know, when men are in power or when, you know, any gender person is in a position of power to someone else. So all in all, what can we learn about you know, lessons from mental illness in Black Swan. First of all, everything in moderation. So you can't be 100% sweet and you can't be 100% dark energy either. There has to be a balance of the two. You cannot compartmentalize your identities like this. You have to really integrate them. Another really big one, don't chase perfectionism. Whether it be in how you look or how you perform or something else, perfectionism does not exist and if it were to exist, it would be at the cost of your life. And trust me, that cost is too high. Another lesson, don't be an overbearing parent because it can lead to pathological perfectionism in your kids. And finally, don't try to take away from other people for the guilt and the paranoia will batch up to you. I hope this was helpful. Let me know if you interpreted anything differently from me or let me know if there was any component of Nina's mental illness that I forgot to mention. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe and I hope you have a great day.